I'm Sue Ann Spoke, and I am playing Barbara. Hi, I'm Mecca White, and I'm playing Twyla. I'm Andre Matthew. I'm playing the police sergeant, and I am the narrator. Hi, I'm Eddie Blackwell. I'm playing Bill and Kira's dad. Hi, I'm Kevin Brief, and I'm playing Edward. Hi, I'm Elijah Haney, and I'm playing as Alexander. Hi, I'm Molly Cash. I'm playing Kira's mother and Sarah. Hi, I'm Adriana Leonard, and I'm playing Callie. Hi, I'm Gilly Messer. I am playing Sam and the reporter. Hi, I'm Christopher Emanuel, and I'm playing Terrence. I'm Bob McCracken. I'm playing Volk or Volcano. I'm Jeanette O'Connor, and I'm playing Graham. Hi, I'm Kyler Scopacasa, and I'm playing Johnny. Hi, my name is Rose Tabluzo, and I'm playing Lena. The Surveillance of Ordinary Things, written by Susan Brunig. Fade in, rural Nevada desert. Interior rusty old pickup truck, day. Two women drive in silence. The driver, Twyla, early 20s, all inked up with a nose ring and unwashed hair, and Barbara, 60s, unkempt from traveling, dressed in a pilled fleece sweater and mom jeans, but sporting a hipster fedora. A gas can on the seat between them. Barbara takes a sip of a Diet Cola, then shoots half a mini bottle of rum. Twyla eyes her sideways. It's not even noon yet. That's a rule? Just sort of a convention, I guess. Oh, conventions are overrated. Barbara offers a bottle of rum to Twyla. Twyla nods to the road. Driving. Barbara opens the second little bottle and starts the ritual again. A gulp of cola, a swig of rum. She puts her head back and closes her eyes. There was an artist, a filmmaker, I used to like a lot in college. Stan Brackage, you ever heard of him? Prolific little bastard. The father of experimental film, they call them, but really, I mean, Maya Darren was the undisputed mother of experimental film. Um, either way, he once made a very long movie called Anticipation of the Night. His plan was to make the movie and then film himself committing suicide at the end. Because young artists are self-involved fucks for the most part. Uh, no, no offense if you are one. None taken. So in the process of making this film, he started a family and his life became very rich and full with filmmaking and art and children. So he didn't kill himself. He faked a shot at the end of the film, probably to much less impact than an actual death, but it's a lovely piece if you like that sort of thing. So art can save your life is the <sighs> point of the story. Barbara looks out the window at the flat nothingness of the desert, the dust, the dead grass, the emptiness. No, it's just a story about a man who had everything. So he decided to live. I don't get it. This is don't choose between two parts of yourself. When you choose, you only live half a life and then the other part of you withers and dies. Right, okay, so look, once we get you to a gas station, you know I can't really drive you an hour back to your car, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we're gonna have to find a way to get you back. Just leave me there, I'll be fine. Well, you're kind of drunk now, so I don't know if I can do that. And how far away are we from anywhere? At least an hour. There were a shit ton of signs warning you about last chance gas. You shouldn't have ignored them. Barbara sits up and polishes off the last of the rum. 30 minutes ago, I swallowed an entire bottle of hydrocodone. So by the time we reach anywhere at all, I plan to be dead. What? H Hydro... I go den. I know what it is. It's delightful. I'm I'm already sinking into a big cotton cloud of sweet sweetness. Twyla stomps on the brake. Are, are you fucking kidding me? Are you fucking actually shitting me? You can't die in my truck. She hits the steering wheel, shakes Barbara some more, but Barbara is a rag doll. Bitch. 
Cut to exterior vast expanse of desert road day. The truck speeds like a demon down the empty road. Super, four days earlier. Interior, Barbara's kitchen, day. Barbara sits at the kitchen table in a faded velour tracksuit drinking coffee. A lean cuisine breakfast spins in the microwave behind her. Her husband, Edward, 60s, in khakis and a tweed jacket, enters, searches the fridge, picks up items, sniffs them, puts them back. There's a frozen thing if you need lunch. Edward opens the freezer, grabs something microwavable, and stuffs it in his bag. The kids will be in by noon. Callie's coming on the train. Sam and Bill and the boy are driving. So, um, you'll be dressed by then, right? Of course. Dressed, though. A and showered. Correct? The microwave dings. Barbara takes a slow sip of coffee. Edward exits through the living room, which is half-assed decorated for Christmas. The boxes of ornaments still out. The scrawny tree only partially adorned. He passes the TV blaring the news. The disappearance of six-year-old Kira Jackson continues to vex law enforcement officials. Police are reviewing surveillance video from local homes, but have so far found nothing. The child simply disappeared. The front door slams. Barbara enters the living room and sits on the couch in front of the TV. The family is devastated. Vertical phone footage of the little black girl, Kira, six, with two Afro puffs riding her bike in circles in the driveway. A giant smile on her face every time she passes her father, who holds a set of training wheels in his hand. Back to scene. Barbara reaches behind the couch and pulls out a bottle of bourbon. She pours a shot into her coffee and carefully puts the bottle back. Exterior, trailer park day. Twyla pulls her truck up to a dusty trailer that has seen better days. Peeling paint, planters with dry dead plants, a dirty plastic Santa leaning against the mailbox. She grabs a large flat package from the back of the truck and goes to the door. She knocks and enters. The stairs missing the top step, requiring extra effort to get through the door. Interior, trailer, day. Twyla looks around the sparse trailer, 80s plaid couch covered with a knitted Afghan and terrible thrift store paintings on the paneled walls. Graham? Twyla raps on some doors and opens them, but the trailer is empty. She exits, stumbling on that missing top step. Shit, Graham. Exterior trailer park, day. Twyla finds Graham, late 70s, in the back chopping wood, but doing a terrible job of it. Damn near hitting her feet, clad only in slippers and chipping the concrete patio when she misses. You're gonna break an ankle on that step. Your brother was here. He wanted Christmas money. Little shit. Graham misses the wood and the ax strikes the patio. Rusty fired him. You should let me do that. Graham shakes her head and strikes again, getting just to splinter off the log. You know, he took my soldering iron. He's a charming little shit. I gave him two 20s. One was for you. He said, uh, you owed him, do you? The whole world owes him. Yeah, sure. I owed him, it's fine. You want some meatloaf? I brought you something, but I think you're gonna hate it. She hands Graham the package. Graham rips the plain brown paper off of it and stares at a painting. It's of her, but completely surreal an old woman, her gray hair wild and growing into the clouds. Her deep wrinkles turn into elaborate tattoos at the side of her face. It's an amateur effort, but a potent image. You hate it. You promised me a nude. It's you. Then paint me nude before I die. Something sexy. Graham picks up the poorly chopped splinters of wood and grabs the painting with her other hand. You really do hate it. Graham takes another look at the painting. I feel exactly like this every day of my life. And no one knows it, but you. Twyla stifles a smile. Graham heads inside, navigating the broken top step. Christmas Eve, interior, Barbara's suburban house, kitchen, night. 
Barbara unboxes a store-bought pie and stuffs it into the oven, cranks the temp up too high. Her daughter, Callie, 30s, enters as Barbara is shoving the box deep into the garbage. Barbara looks up a little drunk and looking guilty. It's okay, mom. We know you don't bake anymore. She hands her mother a small box with a bow. Callie, tomorrow. No gifts tonight. That's awkward. Callie, stung, puts the gift on the counter. Fine. She goes to the living room where the rest of the family sits awkwardly opening small pre-Christmas gifts in front of the scrawny tree. Callie's sister, Sam, early 30s, with her son, Alexander, six, on her knee. Sam's husband, Bill, 30s, sits in what is obviously Edward's recliner. Edward sits on a straight back chair, glaring at him. This tree's pathetic. On. We always have an ugly tree. It's like she just wants Christmas to suck. Oh my God, seriously? Christmas Eve, why? What the frick is wrong with mom? Barbara, get in here, will you? Your daughters are fighting. He gets up while the girls continue bickering and goes to the kitchen. Kitchen. What did you do to upset Callie? Barbara sits at the counter eating burned pie by herself, a snifter of brandy next to her, watching the news on a small TV hung on the wall. A reporter interviews a police sergeant. What we consistently find is that children's Kira's age don't wander when they're lost. They'll usually curl up under a tree somewhere, so we're confident she could still be in the woods behind her house. And we're continuing our search tonight. Did we lose her? Mom, how did you burn a store-bought pie? Carbon is totally carcinogenic. You should not eat that. Barbara mindlessly shoves pie in her mouth and watches the story of lost Kira on the news. God, it's Christmas, for Christ's sake. How did we lose her? I just saw her just the other day. Okay, well, we didn't lose her. Her parents lost her. No, no. We, we as a species, as humanity, I do not understand how we lose a child like that. Our mother, once again, has gone crazy drunk on Christmas Eve. It's crazy? I'm crazy? Isn't it crazy the children disappear and we sit here eating pie? A little girl is sleeping in the woods or who knows where? We are not eating pie. You are eating pie. The pie is burned. No one should be eating the pie. Well, you know what I mean. It is crazy to be celebrating. There's a missing child from our own neighborhood at Christmas time. And that is crazy. Callie takes two mindful deep breaths, but doesn't make it to a third before she picks up the gift she tried to give her mother from the counter and throws it hard into the trash. Fine, then go find her yourself. Interior, master bedroom, night. Barbara and Edward sleep on opposite sides of the king-sized bed with a vast amount of space between them. Barbara lies awake, wide-eyed, unable to sleep. Interior kitchen, breakfast table, day. Edward shuffles in as Callie sips coffee and stares out the kitchen window into the backyard. Sam stabs at the little screen on the refrigerator as she simultaneously scrolls away on her phone. How come nobody updates the addresses in the refrigerator? My address is like four years old. Edward grabs a coffee cup. Now where's your mother? That is such a good question, Daddy. Where is my mother? Callie, she's got you still on Mozart Street. Uh, honey, please. Callie nods out the window to the backyard. Edward looks out the window. Oh, Jesus. Exterior, backyard, day. Barbara in her velour bathrobe is curled up under a tree, sleeping. She opens her eyes and blinks. Occasional dried leaves blow past her, and there, lying on the ground in front of her, is an unassuming condom wrapper. She reaches out, picks it up, and studies it. Just regular, not magnum. She sits up, puts the wrapper in her bathrobe pocket, and heads inside. It is Christmas, after all. Interior, living room, day. The family sits stiffly around the scrawny tree. No one acknowledges that Barbara slept outside. 
Barbara in her damp bathrobe, still dirty from the ground. Modern, but terrible Christmas music plays. Edward opens a gift, hugs Callie, who is rigid with resentment. Sam enters, holding the gift that Callie threw in the trash, brushes coffee grounds off of it with a dish towel, hands it to her mother. This is from Callie. Barbara opens it. It's a fitness tracker. It counts your steps. Oh. You can track yourself. It's, it's fun. Callie kneels at her mother's side, brushes at the grass and residual dirt on her bathrobe. She puts the Fitbit on her mother's wrist. She pulls out her phone and stabs at it, trying to launch the app. Her voice cracks. You log into the account on your phone and it tells you. It tells you and uh, it's fun. I know. It's, it is fun. It'll be fun. I'll keep track of my steps. But Callie is falling apart. Barbara puts a hand on her back. I just wanted to know how cold it was. I wanted to know if she could have made it through the night. I'm sorry. Callie throws down the phone. She's not your child, okay? She's not your child. I am your child. You need to worry about your own children, not some other lady's child who you don't even know. If you ever disappeared, I would have gone to the ends of the earth to find you, all ends. Callie gets up, her father stands, but she pushes him out of the way and, and exits. I mean, we can find out how many steps I take on any given day, but we can't figure out what happened to a missing little girl. Sam's husband, Bill, picks up another gift awkwardly, tries to hand it to Edward. Exterior, rural Nevada, converted warehouse parking lot, day. Johnny, mid-twenties, Twyla's deadbeat brother, sits on the hood of a car in ripped jeans and a ratty biker jacket, holding an old laptop at an angle, trying to get Wi-Fi from the body shop next door. Twyla backs her truck up to the garage door. She unlocks a padlock and pulls on a chain to open the large rolling door and enters a converted warehouse space. Daylight spills into the massive space, which is cut up into lofts and rooms. A collection of young punks drink beer and roll joints at the makeshift kitchen table made out of sawhorses and an old door. Terrence, 20s, a funky African-American kid with short dreads and a beat up leather jacket, spray paints a banner. No justice, no peace. Jesus Christ is freezing. Polk wanted some plywood, is he here? She pulls large sheets of unwieldy plywood out of the back of the truck. Lena, 20s, Filipina, dressed all in black, gets up to help Twyla with the plywood. The guys don't move. He went camping, thank God. Was he mad? When is he not mad? He said he was getting out of Jesus Town for Christmas. Should we clean or something? No, we should not clean. The guys should clean. The guys never clean. Volk bitches, you and I clean. Volk still bitches. Then we get drunk and sleep with them like idiots. Hey, I have not slept with anyone since Jeremy lived here, and that was a huge mistake. The girls maneuver the plywood into a corner by the door. Johnny enters, but does not help them. Okay, but still, they shouldn't get laid at all if they can't clean. We have to agree on that, or we're bad feminists. Johnny jumps up and grabs a crossbeam, swings his legs. But it's Christmas. Lena shakes her head. They go to the truck to get more plywood. That theory assumes that women only have sex to please men, and I am fundamentally opposed to that thinking. Then we need to only sleep with men who do not visit the warehouse, and we need to not clean wherever they live. I mean it, Twy. We are single-handedly raising an entire generation of men to not clean. They put down the second round of plywood and brush their dirty hands on their pants. I just don't think the training of a generation should be my responsibility. Johnny swings his legs up to the beam and hangs upside down. His crotch ends up squarely in Lena's face as she passes. She dodges him and goes to the makeshift kitchen. Twyla slots her brother's upside down shoulder. Asshole, give me my fucking Christmas money. And give Graham her soldering iron back. You fucking sell that, I will cut you. I had to give your Christmas money to Eddie at the body shop so we could use his Wi-Fi. What's wrong with your own Christmas money? Johnny writes himself and jumps down. I was out of weed. 
deleted scene. Barbara and Alexander and Sam trudge through the woods behind the subdivision. Sam and her son think it's a family hike, but Barbara checks methodically under trees for the missing girl. Interior, staircase, night. Edward stands at the top of the stairs to the basement next to a heavy old oak desk. If I knew it was gonna be such a trial, I would have asked one of the girls. Barbara shuffles down the hall, pulling on a pair of leather utility gloves. It's a desk, for God's sake. I know what it is. You don't need heavy duty workman's gloves to move a piece of furniture. I don't want to get splinters. There aren't splinters. Oh, there were splinters. Back when I was your student, there were splinters. Hey, 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 hey don't push. I'm not. I can, I can feel it. You can't. <laughs> and why are you storing this anyway? Because I got a new one. A new desk. Yeah, it's glass. He shoves some boxes around to make some space for the desk. Barbara pulls the stray condom wrapper out of her pocket, the one she found in the driveway, and puts it down on the desk. Edward sees it and freezes, holding an old moth-eaten wool blanket. Well, can you blame me? You've been a goddamn zombie for years now. A monogamous zombie, though. You can give me that, at least. Yeah, well, that's a given. Ugh, you always strike so low. You've lost your mind. You're fucking your students. You slept under a tree last night. You could not possibly ever understand that. He covers the desk with the blanket and the wrapper flutters to the floor. She straightens the blanket, smooths it, and shoves the desk into a corner. Are we done here? Yes, we're done. He heads up the stairs. She leans against the desk and calls after him. Just keep using condoms. They have an antibiotic resistant gonorrhea these days. We are done. Interior, Barbara suburban house, bedroom, day. Barbara sits on the bed, Fitbit in her hand, a suitcase next to her. 5,002 steps. How many steps does it take to leave your life behind? She shakes it like a magic eight ball. Hmm. Five thousand and four. Exterior, rural highway, day. Barbara drives, the Fitbit securely on her wrist. Exterior, gas station, day. A group of raucous teenagers explode out of a massive SUV and into the mini mark. The driver stays to pump gas. He removes his plaid hipster fedora and plops it on the roof as he leans against the truck, taking selfies and swiping at his phone. Deleted scene. The obnoxious teens take over the mini mart, trying to buy alcohol and cigarettes. Deleted scene. Barbara sees the used car lot next door and trades in her hulking Lexus for a sparkly purple Mustang convertible. The teens from the gas station peel out of the parking lot. The plaid hipster fedora flies off the roof of the teens SUV, sails through the air and lands on the ground next to the Mustang. Exterior, highway, day. Barbara speeds down the open road in the Mustang, a suitcase in the back seat and the fedora squarely on her head. Interior, Barbara's kitchen, night. Deleted scene. Edward sits at the kitchen table as Callie and Sam question him about their mother's sudden disappearance. He insists she's staying with her sister, Sylvia, in Denver. Callie picks up her phone and stabs at it angrily. Interior, motel room, night. Barbara's phone buzzes. She sees that it's Callie, lets the call go to voicemail. Interior, kitchen, night. Mom, this is crazy. We call us when you get to Aunt Sylvia's and tell us what the heck is going on. She slams the phone onto the table and glares at her father. This family is not okay, Daddy. We are not fine. Interior, motel room, night. Barbara sits eating her gas station snacks and pouring the little bottles of vodka into her can of soda. She jabs at the remote and stops on another news report about Kira, the missing little girl. 
Police are calling off the local search for missing Kira Jackson and focusing their investigation on the family. Kira's parents stand utterly broken in front of the news camera. They can barely speak through their tears. Um, <clears throat> if this, if this, if this were a little uh, white child, we we firmly believe this search would would not be called off. We the, firmly believe this. On the day after, on the day after Christmas. Blurry video footage of an African-American man leading a little girl out of a supermarket, Watson Food Town. Surveillance footage in Watson County shows what may be Kira and an unidentified African-American male. That is not her in the video. It's not. A friend leads her away from the cameras as she breaks down and sobs. Back to scene. Seriously? That's it? It's not the same girl. She turns off the TV, stares blankly into space. God, where are you, little girl? Where the hell are you? Her phone rings again. The caller ID, Edward. She goes to the bathroom, fills the sink with water, looks at herself in the mirror, inspects her wrinkles. When the sink is full, she submerges the phone, hits the light, and exits. Exterior parking lot day. Deleted scene. Barbara enters the store where Kira was last seen, and the bagger unceremoniously announces the little girl is dead. Shocked, Barbara returns to a car in a daze. Insert surveillance video. Exterior parking lot day. Barbara, just a blur, wearing a hat in the video, shuffles to the Mustang. She puts her bag of groceries on the roof and unlocks the door, pausing for a moment to wipe her eyes with her sleeve. Interior purple Mustang day. Barbara sits in the Mustang, rattled, and looks up at the surveillance camera over the door. She watches the customers going about their day normally. You don't even know her. Children die every day. Children you don't know die every single day all over the world. She pulls a bag of chips out of the grocery bag and tries to open them. She wrestles with it until the bag explodes and showers chips everywhere. She drops her head to the steering wheel and breaks into sobs. Insert, vertical cell phone footage of little Kira and her fat pigtails drawing with chalk in the driveway. She looks up at the camera, happy, free, and alive. Interior, Twyla's truck, day. Twyla and Graham turn down a dirt road, an overnight bag on Graham's lap. Graham, I know you're pissed, but- Your mother has been threatening to put me in a home for as long as I can remember. Well, not, she didn't when she was a child, I mean. Oh, well, maybe then too. I'm not moving. They pull up to the trailer. I'm not moving in with her. I'm not moving into the old folks home. I'm not moving. I got arms and legs, it still work. My heart's okay and my mind's not gone. She's just worried that you're gonna fall and nobody's gonna. <sighs> Maybe she's gonna fall. You ever think of that? Maybe you're gonna fall. People fall. Gravity pulls us down and we can't stop it. It's a fact of life. She opens the door and jumps deftly out of the truck before Twilight pulls the parking brake. It happens sometimes, so get over it. She waves her hands around in the air. Oh no, I'm gonna fall. Graham slams the truck's door. She heaves her bag up the last broken step. Twyla follows and trips on it. Interior, Graham's trailer, day. Graham goes to the kitchen and bangs cabinets angrily. She puts a kettle on. Twyla's painting is leaning against the refrigerator. Graham, you live like an hour from mom, an hour from the hospital. Who needs a hospital? I'm not sick. She pulls out a large Ziploc bag and shoves some homemade Christmas cookies into it. I got the clinic at the community center. They take good care of me. You want cookies? You want tea? Twyla takes a reindeer out of the bag and bites the head off. Yeah, sure. I'll have tea. Interior, Twyla's truck, day. Twyla drives with her knee as she dials her phone. There's no one on the highway anyway. Mom, she doesn't want to move. I did. 
I did tell her. We have to, okay. Okay. I think we should let her, okay, All right, bye. She hangs up and there by the side of the road next to the purple Mustang is Barbara in her hipster fedora with her thumb out. We've been here before, so cut to interior, Twyla's truck day. Twyla speeds like a bat out of hell down the empty rural highway as Barbara's drugged head falls against the window. Fuck. Twyla, shaking, drives and dials her phone, swerving and pulling herself back into her lane. Graham, Graham, pick up. Pick up now. Where is the, the community center? I need to know where the community center is, the one with the clinic. Now, Graham, please pick up. It's an emergency. She puts the phone in her lap, still speeding. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Barbara is sliding off the seat despite her seatbelt, stone cold unconscious. Twyla hits her shoulder, but Barbara is out. Wake up, lady. Fuck, 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 fuck. Lady, seriously, wake the fuck up. She picks up the phone and stabs at it. Uh, community center with medical, fa not faculty. God damn it, let me finish the word myself. And the phone rings. She answers. Graham? Interior, Barbara's suburban house, basement, day. Deleted scene. Callie and Edward go through Barbara's boxes of poetry and manuscripts in the basement. Callie insists that her mother is mentally unwell. Edward hides the truth that he's been cheating and agrees that Barbara is just crazy. Interior, warehouse, night. Barbara wakes in a dark space, moonlight pouring in through a metal framed window covered in chain link fencing. Shadows of people come into focus. No, wait, they're mannequins. They're mannequins wrapped in foil and string lights. Plaster casts of heads and torsos and breasts. Wild tapestries hang from the ceiling and layers of Moroccan and Asian rugs make the concrete space kind of cozy. She gets up and the room spins. She lies back down. Oh. Interior, warehouse, kitchen, night. Twyla and the punks gather nervously in the kitchen. I don't know what to do, okay? She was dying. They released her to me. What should I have done? Left her on the fucking curb? Johnny throws himself onto a couch. It twy shit. She's got a narcosol out, first of all. We have to hide our bongs and shit. If Volk came home right now, we'd be fucked six ways to Sunday. Can you keep your voice down? I'm sorry, okay? I, I think we should let her sleep it off. We? She's yours, Twy. There is no we. And don't they do a 5150 hold if you try to kill yourself? Shouldn't she be locked up somewhere for 72 hours? It's a clinic at a community center, Graham's community center, where she plays checkers and shit, okay? Jesus, Johnny, they didn't hold her. I don't know. I'm just like, you know, this This is the the first time New Year's Eve that folks been gone and we, we can finally have an actual party and there's like, somebody's mom here, it's weird. Yeah, it's weird. You know what? When she wakes up, I'm gonna put her in the truck and take her back to her car and then you guys can chill the fuck out, okay? Barbara emerges looking unsteady and not in any shape to drive anywhere. <sighs> she looks at all the art and sculptures. It's a beautiful mess of a place. She sees Johnny sprawled on the vintage velvet couch. She looks around in a daze. Well, you're too young to be dead, but I don't exactly hate the afterlife. This is kind of nice. I found a medical center. Damn it. She looks around the warehouse, walks over to an elaborate golden Buddha, but loses her balance and grabs oh. onto a chair. I think we lost your phone, so. I don't have one anymore. Can we call someone for you? No, there's not really anyone to call. So. You just take me back to the car, I guess. I mean, are we far? In the morning, though. I mean, it's dark, and I don't think you're in any shape to drive. So you all live here? Yeah, you're in the landlord's room. He's camping. Oh. Volk calls it Zazura, some kind of legend or something. He lets us live here super cheap if we produce. Produce? If we make art. He wants us to be productive, so we have to be constantly making shit or we get kicked out. You can't fake it either. 
I tried to work on the same series for a year once and he was pissed. I fucking almost lost my room. So you guys made all of this? Well, not the Buddhas, but a lot of it's ours. Some of it's Volk's, some of it's the previous tenants. Volk? Volcano, but with a K for some reason. He blows up a lot. Well, I meet him. Well, he's camping and you're in his room, so you kind of have to go before he comes back. Barbara approaches some metal sculptures, three skeletons, each more anguished than the last. She touches them. Oh, these need to be sanded. Oh, uh, fuck you? Oh, they're compelling, but they, they need sanding. The rough edges are taken away from the visual line. And the this hand should be on his head in anguish. I mean, if it's a series, which I, I think it is. Oh, okay, Twy. It's time for your friend to go now, tonight. He gets up and retreats to his room. Barbara looks at the sculptures. She gently bends the metal arm of the skeleton until it's touching the skull. And it creates a feeling of anguish that was indeed missing. See what I mean? Interior, Twyla's truck, night, pouring rain, deleted scene. Twyla tries to take Barbara back to the Mustang, but it's been towed and she realizes Barbara has no money and is in no shape to be dropped off anywhere. Interior warehouse, kitchen, day. The punk street coffee in the kitchen. Johnny sucks on a bong. Lena sews a long piece of painted fabric. Terrence paints a protest banner in the corner with a respirator on. Dude, you can't do that inside. Go out in the parking lot. I'm wearing a respirator. Asshole, we aren't wearing respirators. Twyla pulls a coffee cup out of the dirty sink and washes it. She pours herself some coffee. Barbara emerges again from Volk's room. All heads snap from Barbara to Twyla. Fucking kidding me. I'm sorry, okay? I meant to tell you, I'm sorry. Barbara enters the kitchen and looks at the sink of dishes. She picks up a sponge. Actually, uh, the guys need to do their own dishes. Oh, I, I thought I should help out. Johnny rushes over. He takes the sponge from her and starts to wash. No, no, you can't stay. You cannot. Bro, uh, let her wash the dishes. No, 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 no. Everybody's going to start liking having you around, and then we've got a problem. Barbara sits and looks again at the skeletons. She turns to Terrence. So, what are you working on? Uh, I don't like to talk about my art. Ruins it. Yeah, but you have to learn to talk about your art. Look, ma'am, you kind of need to back off. We've got a little break this week and we're relaxing. I see. Ma'am, is it? She gets up. She examines more of the paintings. Does Volk do critiques with you in this community? Oh my fucking God, no. We just have to work. Terrence gets up and heads outside. He's a little sensitive about critiques. He got kicked out of Chicago. The city? The Art Institute. Oh, but if you critique each other, the work gets better. I mean, it's like if you do push-ups, your arms get stronger and nobody likes to do push-ups, but Everybody likes strong arms, right? <sighs> yeah, I don't, I am a, that was a bad analogy. Interior, Barbara's suburban house, day. Callie washes dishes as Sam, Bill, and Alexander eat cereal at the table, staring and poking at their respective devices. Edward enters, distracted and poking at his own phone. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back to work next week, Daddy. What, what are we going to do if Mom's not home yet? Me. The, the Fitbit. What? The Fitbit. She fishes the filthy Fitbit box out of the trash. She grabs her phone and jabs at it. Where does Aunt Sylvia live? The last time we saw her, I was about three and she came here. Why don't you know where your own aunt lives? Dad, where does Aunt Sylvia live? Why? We know where you live, Aunt Kelly. Because it looks like mom is in a body shop about 300 miles away. 
you know where we live, why wouldn't... I think Sylvia's in Denver. Denver? Mom's going to Denver? She's not even anywhere to, near Denver. Well, I thought she'd fly. Honey, we don't know if she is wearing the Fitbit. She could have lost it. She could have thrown it away. Okay, well, it's moving. If it's her, she's walking. I mean, find 500 steps a day alone. Ugh, it's ridiculous. Your mother is not walking around a body shop in the middle of nowhere. She's at her sister's cooling off because she's upset. Did I hear the door? Suddenly, Edward's student, Sarah, 20s, enters briskly, all flushed from outside, almost oh, like uh, she had a key. You uh, all remember my student, Sarah? Who? Your, your mother and I uh, have been talking about divorcing. Alexander looks up from his tablet. Sam gives her husband a look and Bill ushers the child out of the room. Callie looks at Sarah, confused. Did you ring the bell? Callie goes back to her phone, not processing the situation at all. I said we're divorcing. That's not possible. Look, if mom doesn't answer my call soon, I'm driving to this body shop. We all are. Interior warehouse day. Barbara, in a respirator, holds up one side of a large banner as Terrence spray paints resist on it. When he's done, she picks up a can and deftly sprays a raised fist onto the banner. They carefully carry the banner outside to let it dry in the parking lot. They return, and Barbara pulls off her respirator. It's worthwhile, but you know you should be shooting. I mean, if you call yourself a photographer, you should always be shooting. I'm not shooting right now. I'm working on banners and I'm making these. No, well, those are just distractions. Listen, I know Twyla wants to help you and you seem nice enough, but whatever it is you're trying to do here, we don't want it. Well, you're just like, what's his name over there who wants sand as fucking sculptures? You want the accolades, you don't want to do the work. Hey, I'm not like Johnny, okay? Everything comes easily to him. He takes his shit and somehow it's hard. What happened in Chicago? Stop trying to do whatever it is you think you're doing here. You're not our savior. And you're definitely not my savior. Terrence disappears into his room, returns in a coat and hat. He exits, punching the aluminum garage door as he leaves. The sound reverberates through the warehouse. Barbara heads to the kitchen. The outside door swings open and Terrence heads to his room emerges with two cameras slung over his shoulder. Barbara looks at him. He looks at Barbara. I couldn't find my voice. Barbara sets her sights on Johnny, but he lies stoned out of his mind on the couch, headphones on. She looks at Twyla. So, what are you working on? How to find your car and get you out of here. No offense, but this isn't exactly sustainable. Barbara turns to Lena. Lena throws herself onto a chair. You? We're all taking a break. Volk is gone. We all want to rest. What do you want from us anyway? I want to see your work. I want to look at it. I want to talk about it. I have not been anywhere like this before, really. And frankly, someday, you won't be living in such a perfect space and you're gonna to have to fight like hell to find time to make your art. And then you're gonna have children and everyone's gonna judge you from taking time away from them and you'll become exhausted and drained and sad and lost. And eventually you'll just... <sighs> Forget. Looks like the Mustang has been impounded. Let's go get it. Deleted scene. Twyla and Barbara find the Mustang at the impound lot, but they don't have the money to retrieve it. Twyla decides to try to borrow the money from her grandmother. They head to the trailer. Exterior, Graham's trailer, day. Twyla pulls up to her grandmother's trailer. You want me to stay here? No, I'm gonna try and borrow some money so we can send you on your way. Come on. Interior, Graham's trailer, day. The two women enter the trailer. Graham, he's probably out back. They hear a loud whack, then a blood curdling shriek. <laughs> Exterior, Graham's trailer, day. 
Twyla and Barbara rush to the patio where Graham stands screaming, her foot gushing blood. She is fully lopped off a toe while chopping wood in her open-toed slippers. Uh, oh. Motherfucker! Oh. oh, God damn it. Graham falls to the ground, gripping her ankle, the toe lying in shock itself a few feet away. Barbara rushes inside and emerges with a pile of kitchen towels and a plastic baggie. She throws the towels at Twyla. Don't look. Graham and Twyla instinctively look and quickly look away as Barbara picks up the bloody toe with the plastic baggie as though she's cleaning up after a dog. Oh. Twyla wraps Graham's foot with towels. Barbara takes off her own sock and uses it to secure the towels onto Graham's foot. Oh, now go inside and get her a blanket for the road so she doesn't go into shock. Twyla runs inside. Get some ice and a shoe. Twyla emerges with a warm coat and one shoe and a cup of ice. Barbara puts the ice in the baggie and has no choice but to stuff it into her pocket as they carry Graham to the truck. They hoist her in with much difficulty and cover her with the coat. Barbara takes the toe on ice carefully out of her pocket and gently puts it into Graham's coat pocket. She looks up to see Twyla's watching her. Well, it's her toe. <laughs> Interior, warehouse, night. Barbara and Twyla enter and the punks all deflate. Why, why Twyla, just why? Because she just helped save Graham's life, so she's my guest and she stays another night. Johnny stomps into his room. You can still have your party. She's not a cop for fuck's sake. Wait, what happened to your girl? Interior, Barbara's suburban house, night. New Year's Eve. The remaining family members sit grimly in front of the TV, an unopened bottle of champagne and four glasses on the coffee table, a bowl of chips on Callie's lap. Alexander sits on the floor, poking at his tablet. What if she's dead? Jesus, Cal, my kid. He's not listening. He's always listening. She's fine. She'll call soon. She'll come home. Do, do you know what all that shit is in the basement? Language, please. Crap, crap in the basement. Have you seen it? They're like crates of poetry books from the 70s. Is that yours? Dad? Uh, the, to mothers. What, when did mom read poetry? Like, like a lot of poetry. Your mom was very artsy in college. You mean like classical poetry? Or, or like Ginsburg. What, why would that even matter? It's the difference between literary and artsy. I mean, maybe she was into literature. That's normal. For the record, I believe Allen Ginsberg began as a classically trained poet before Hal, of course. Well, there's just a lot of sh crap I've never seen and it's weird and I think that we need to get rid of it. Well, I wanna see it first. It's junk, like weird junk, like, like garbage. I want to get a dumpster. Edward shifts in his chair, sighs, looks a little worried. On TV, young revelers in party hats dancing. Oh, maybe if we don't see her in the new year, we should call somebody. Call somebody? Yeah, make a report or something. Well, you're the one that claims she's safely at her sister's house. I mean, what the? Dad. I'm getting an apartment. I love somebody. What? 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 Alexander puts his tablet down. On TV, the New Year countdown begins. 10, 9, 8, 7. Interior, warehouse, night. Barbara stands on a coffee table wearing a feather boa around her neck and the hipster fedora on her head. She holds a bottle of champagne in one hand and a lit sparkler in the other. The warehouse is jam-packed with diverse and eclectic people, mostly young, but the mechanics from the body shop next door are there too. Six, five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Interior, Barbara's suburban house, living room, night. The TV erupts in celebration. Bill just now struggling with the foil wrapper on the champagne. Should we be yelling or something? 
Bill hands his kid a juice box. Happy New Year, bud. The girls stare accusingly at their father. Interior warehouse night. Barbara and Lena sit on a vintage velvet couch in the middle of the New Year's Eve madness, drinking champagne from the bottle and sucking on a joint when it comes around to them. Oh, why textiles? Mm, why not like wood or metal? I worry because traditionally textile work has been for women. And I'd like to see young women break that stereotype. Everybody says that because sewing and weaving is traditionally women's work. And knitting and tatting and darning, it's service work. It makes me so angry. A, the textile industry was built on the backs of sewing women. And B, men have always adorned themselves. But is it just adornment that you're interested in? Because your sculptures look like they're about texture and, oh, I, I don't know, like some sort of tactile experience? Fucking hell, yes. That's exactly it. A tactile experience, which is not gendered. Thank you. Everyone has nerve endings. Everyone feels texture. It's utilitarian, but it's also, I don't know, about just pleasure. Barbara looks up to see Johnny recording the whole party with his phone. Oh, Johnny, stop recording. Your brain is supposed to make its own memories. We never get to use our phones inside. They're forbidden. Well, why do you have to record everything? Why can't an experience just be yours? Why do old people hate technology? Johnny turns his phone to film Barbara and Lena on the couch. Because we know that our brains will make a more interesting memory. Oh, well, it's not your world anymore. It's ours. It's all ours. <laughs> well, for God's sakes, at least turn it horizontally. Ah. The music swells and Lena jumps up to dance. She grabs Barbara's hand and they both dance wildly as the party pulses around them. It is a new fucking year. Insert surveillance video. Exterior parking lot, night. Time stamp footage of the warehouse door from the body shop's camera. Time lapse blurry images of people outside, smoking, throwing up, passing joints, Johnny and Lena drunkenly making out. Every time the door opens, light spills out into the parking lot. Finally, Barbara emerges in her boa and hat and stands alone, smoking and occasionally drinks from a bottle of champagne. She lifts the bottle and drunkenly toasts the sky. Interior, warehouse, New Year's Day, day. The punks in the kitchen hung over and sucking on coffee cups and cigarettes. The warehouse is littered with bottles and trash and random passed out party guests. The metal door to the warehouse creaks open and slams. It is the infamous Volcano Morrison, 60s, the toughest nail owner landlord of the warehouse makeshift artist residence. He enters and drops a massive backpack complete with tin cooking gear dangling from the sides. He's something between a mountain man and a dude from the Renaissance Fair. He looks around at the detritus from the party and at the unbelievable pile of dirty dishes in the sink. Twyla picks up a sponge to start washing them, but Lena stops her. The guys go back to their coffee drinking and their joint rolling, trying to look like nothing is wrong. Volk picks up about five smartphones that are lying about and holds the stack in his massive, filthy hand. We wash our own dishes, Volk. This is all the guys. We shouldn't have to clean up after. But Volk is already heading to his room. He kicks a random passed out rocker dude who is sleeping on the floor. Lena shakes a mechanic awake and tries to usher him out before Volk loses his shit. Johnny looks pleadingly at Twyla. Volk, uh, we should maybe talk but he disappears inside his room. They wait for a moment. You should have told him. I have a functioning asshole. I didn't need a new one. We're all getting ripped a new one in about five, four, three, two. And Volk emerges. Twyla founder. Volk approaches the kitchen. Some of the guys try to slip away, but his stare is paralyzing. He rubs his beard. They know he's going to blow. His name isn't Volcano for nothing. Why? My fucking sister, dude. Why? Why in the name of Eros? In the name of love itself? 
Why is the goddess of my finest dreams, the inimitable Barbara Moses, quintessential performance poet of 1977 and beyond, splayed beautifully and perfectly in my very own bed? The punks all look at him confused. His voice rides away from soft to booming as he approaches each of them, waving his arms with dramatic flourish. Is this a gift? A penance? Have you done something horrific and are somehow making amends? Blank stares all around. Is it gratitude, perchance, for opening my art space to you EDM fucks with your impossibly inane taste for all that is bland? Well, only Terrence listens to EDM. I used to, but no. P perhaps you have somehow grown in my absence beyond your pathetic and scant years, stretching the societal tether you so gladly die. I found her. She was dying in my truck. Volk, are you trying to say you know her? Know her? To know her would be to understand the mysteries of the cosmos, the universal synchronicity of life and love, art and truth. It is, I tell you, impossible to know her. And then... Barbara emerges wearing one of Volk's paint-splattered shirts and a pair of his boxers. Her hair perfectly mussed and looking less like a haggard mom and more like a rumpled artist. Volk rushes to her, takes her arm, and leads her to a vintage regal-looking velvet chair. You need coffee, yes? Let me get you something. I see there was quite a fet here last night. Who are you, if I may be so bold? He brings her a coffee and sits cross-legged at her feet. I ask myself that daily, my dear. Who is she again? Oh, has my phone. Interior, Barbara's suburban house, day. Callie on the phone. Sam and Bill roll their suitcases to the door. Seriously? You fell out a missing persons report online. Y yeah, but she's mentally unstable. Well, I don't know, but don't you want a description or something? Fine, fine, fine. Yes, thank you. We both have to work in the morning. I also have to work in the morning, but I've called in sick this week because my mother is missing. First of all, we're pretty sure she's at Aunt Sylvia's. And second, they actively don't look for missing adults. People are allowed to go away if they feel like it. She is mentally unwell, Sam. She's not allowed to go away in her condition. She opens a laptop. Fine. I'm going to tell them in the report that she's crazy. She has mental issues and they need to go find her. That's not entirely the truth. Callie taps away. Sam watches her. I'm leaving. Should we like hug or something? Callie sighs loudly and gets up to awkwardly hug her sister. Deleted scene. Edward and his student, Sarah, rent an apartment together. Interior warehouse day. Volk walks Barbara around the warehouse, describing the origin of each of the Buddhas. This one I got in 89. It matches the one in the garden. Garden? The so-called garden. You know, I, I saw you perform multiple times from 77 to 81. Some of the most thought-provoking work I've ever seen. He took poetry and movement to such a level. He opens a heavy metal fire door, loud beeping. He punches some numbers into an old yellowed keypad and holds the door for Barbara. Exterior warehouse garden, day. A greenhouse made entirely of old wooden windows is built around enormous potted plants, maybe some marijuana, but also orchids and mini palm trees. And of course, a whole lot of Buddhas. They sit on an old fashioned metal slider bench painted white, but covered in graffiti. Ah, uh, Barbara. The name Barbara is derived from the Greek barbaros, meaning essentially alien or foreign, or perhaps in this case, exotic. A cat from the body shop appears and eventually hops onto Barbara's lap. Etymology is sort of a hobby of mine. Spoken by a man they call Volcano. You know, I really was trying to end it all. I just 
didn't expect Twyla to be so resourceful. Oh, I mean, don't ever think of that preposterous and hideous event again. You are an honored guest here. He gets up, examines some orchids, waters some of the plants. My God, I loved watching you. It was riveting. I was smitten with you in my youth. Smitten. Why don't you do critiques with the kids? I mean, I am assuming that you do have some kind of background. Critiques? <laughs> I can barely get them to produce. Screw critiques. I deliver threats. I once tried to withhold heat in the winter. That failed on many fronts. Apparently, people who are bitterly cold can think only of warmth and sex. Art does not make the cut. Well, would you mind if I did? <laughs> My dear. I have no idea who you are. And if you weren't suicidal before, you most certainly would become so. Interior warehouse, kitchen, day. Johnny stabs furiously at his phone. What did he say her last name was, Moser? Moses. Did we ever even know her first name? I'm getting nothing but Spokio and White Page's heads. It's gotta be something. He's fawning over her like she invented the sun or something. Try the year, try 1978, Barbara Moses Poet. Performance Poet. Johnny and Terrence huddle over the phone. Terrence squints. I think we found something. Lena and Twyla squeeze in around the phone. Well, that's definitely a stage in a microphone. I hate to say this, but I think she's naked. Did they seriously not have photography in the 70s? Why is it so shitty? I think it's from a newspaper, like a flyer. What the fuck is a flyer? A flyer? Come on. Paper sign, you've seen flyers. Signs for shows stapled onto telephone poles. Oh, I didn't know they were called that. Terrence turns the phone a little sideways. Yeah, she's naked and maybe crawling? It's kind of hot. Ew, she's like 60. Not in this picture. There's got to be something else. Johnny keeps poking at his phone. There's a Barbara Moses Jones on a missing person list. What? Give me that. I can't be her. I found her by the side of the road with no money and no phone, so, right? I totally can't. Because she's like, she's too normal. Maybe she has dementia and she was wandering. Maybe her family is looking for her. Why wouldn't she tell us? I'm guessing that people with dementia don't come out and tell everyone they have dementia. Barbara and Volk return from the garden. Johnny stashes the phone. Barbara nods at the crew and rats them all out. Well, I've seen evidence of Lena and Johnny's work, but Terrence, he's distracting himself. And Twyla, I don't have a clue what she does. They look at each other incredulously. Barbara sits at the table with them. Twyla averts her eyes. I think she just threw me under the bus. Well, now that Volk is back, I think we should start talking about your work. I want to do critiques with you. The punks look at her, shake their heads, oh, hell no, and disperse. Twyla looks back at her, shakes her head at the betrayal. Interior, Twyla's room, day. Twyla's room is a sty, a rumpled mattress on the floor, beer bottles and coffee cups everywhere. And leaning against all four walls are canvases of various sizes, stacked haphazardly all facing the wall. Twyla turns a few paintings around to look at them, then puts them back where they were. She sits on the bed and kicks at the paintings in frustration. Barbara knocks and opens the door. She looks at Twyla's room, goes to turn a painting around, but Twyla's glare stops her. I'm not participating in critiques. You can't just fucking... It's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be painful. It's the only way to get better. Twyla's face crinkles. She looks like she might cry. You haven't even done anything since, what, the 80s? You can't just tell us to work when you don't work. So, you paint. At least I haven't tried to kill myself in a stranger's car, so. Understood. She exits, gently closing the door. Twyla picks up an empty beer bottle and throws it against the wall. Interior warehouse, kitchen, day. 
The punks shuffle out of their rooms in the morning, rummaging for food and coffee. They hear a rustling and look over to see Bulk sleeping on one of the vintage couches. Oh, this is gonna be interesting. 